Hi, everyone. Welcome to this, the third edition of the LLM Makerspace. My name is Jim Dowling. I'm CEO and co-founder of Hopsworks. And today I'm going to walk you through an example of an LLM system for doing check fraud detection. So checks are money transfers where you write them on a piece of paper and you give them to someone and that's considered legal tender. It's payment for services rendered. And in some countries, uh, I'm an Anglo-Saxon myself, I'm from Ireland, we have checks. And uh, other countries like America also use checks, but most, much of the rest of the world has moved on. Um, but there are a lot of people who still process checks, particularly people who work in the financial industry, in banks, they get these physical pieces of paper coming in daily, and they have to validate that these are not fraudulent. So we're going to look at how we can use LLMs for that. <clears throat> a little bit of background before we get started. We can see here that um, you, you can access the videos of the previous edition of the LM Lakers space on Hopsworks YouTube channel. We've got this first one was on function calling at an air quality uh, system that we built. And the second one uh, was on uh, being able to uh, have private PDFs and be able to query them with help of an LLM. So uh, th then this edition will also appear up on the YouTube channel over time. So let's get a look at the problem that we're going to solve. And the problem, as I said, is check fraud detection. And we've been following a particular architecture when we build these systems, these AI systems or LLM systems. And the architecture that we're following is I call the feature training inference pipeline architecture. The idea is that you decompose your AI system into smaller modules that you can then easily compose together to build an AI system. So we're going to break it down into smaller parts. The first part is what we call a feature pipeline. This will take our data that comes in. It'll parse that data. It'll create features. We'll look at a feature table containing our data. Mm -hmm. We call that a feature group. We'll also train a model. So we're going to train a very simple model for um, fraud detection in checks. And then we're finally going to do some inference. And we're going to do inference uh, in this case, for fraud detection, and, and many of you are thinking, what the hell is he doing fraud detection with LLMs for? Because frauds are pieces of paper. We take photographs of them and we do optical character recognition. We extract the text from those checks and then we check for fraud. Where does, where does an LLM come into play? And this is actually an interesting insight for me because <clears throat> I talk to people internally about this and, and I'm not an expert. I wasn't an expert in, in, in banking. But when checks are marked as fraudulent, a human has to go along and write an explanation as to why that check is considered fraudulent. So that's actually a, a large amount of work that a lot of uh, financial institutions engage in, which is they hire people who uh, evaluate whether checks are considered fraudulent or not, and then they write an explanation as to why that check is considered fraudulent. So we're going to use the LLM to generate that explanation for us. So that will free up these people to be more productive in other enterprises. Um, at the moment, you can see it as being a decision support tool. I think um, maybe in many or, uh, jurisdictions, the AIs won't be allowed to write those descriptions, but what they can do is suggest a description and the human can accept that uh, description if they're happy with it and, and improve their productivity in that way. If you have questions, you can place them, by the way, in the chat or there's a Q&A function above. As a button with Q&A, and I can see somebody asked, will the recording be available? You just arrived a little bit late because I explained that it would be available on our YouTube channel uh, in the coming days. So we're going to build our check fraud system with a feature pipeline. We're going to take some images of checks, and then we're going to have some, they're going to be labeled. So it's going to be supervised machine learning. We're going to train a very simple model to predict whether that check is fraudulent or not. And then we're going to use a batch inference pipeline. So check fraud uh, prediction systems are often batch systems. You'll get the checks come in into the bank or the financial institution, and then they're fed through these large machines that do optical character recognition on them. And then we'll have out of that some textual data describing the check. So those uh, prediction systems that are predicting whether checks are fraudulent or not tend to run in batches, often nightly. And then what we want to do is to be able to uh, write descriptions for the checks that have been labeled as potential, as, as predicted as being fraudulent. We want to write a description as to why the uh, why we why we predicted that this particular check was fraud fraudulent. Okay, so we're going to write it in those three parts. It's a batch AI system, and we'll have those two other pipelines. So it's basically three programs. So, um, 
let's look at the problem to begin with. So what is a check? You may or may not know what a check is. This is a pretty good data set from Dataset Ninja. We're not going to use this data set. We're going to use a slightly different one. Uh, but it'll give you an idea. Here you can see we have some checks. And um, this particular data set has 112 images. We have slightly more. And uh, you can see it's generating many different labels, 784 labels and seven classes. So there's a really nice visualization tool. I hope you can see it here. Let's zoom in. So we have a check here. And when you pull, when you draw this over, it shows you what the, the uh, OCR system will do. So you can see the OCR system, we start out with a check here. Uh, there's no markings on the check, but the OCR system will extract these bounding boxes. It'll identify these bounding boxes on the check. And then um, you'll use optical character recognition to extract what you think is written there. So this is a, a traditional deep learning uh, CNN style network problem. So uh, there are many existing frameworks you can use out there for this particular problem. And, and many banks will already have something uh, for this. Um, so this is not something new, not something we're going to go into today. We'll assume that this exists in your financial institution. If it doesn't, then we can you know, look at a. You can look around the internet and find many good examples for it. So we're going to we're going to basically assume that this exists and then from there we're going to train our model to predict whether a check is fraudulent or not given we have this supervised uh, set of samples with labels and then we're going to use our lm to generate the description for it okay so next one let's look at the code so the code the code's not there it's not there so the code is available here on hopsworks tutorials if you want to jump in here so go to github um Hopsworks dash tutorials. If you search for that, you'll find it. Um, you know, feel free to give it a star if you're there. And if you go into this directory, advanced tutorials, and inside advanced tutorials, we have fraud check detection. That's the code we're going to go through today. So we can see here that there are three programs and they're all notebooks. We have a feature pipeline. That's number one. We're going to run that first, a training pipeline to train a a very simple, um, I think it's an XGBoost model to, to predict whether the check's fraudulent or not. And then the inference pipeline, which will have our LLM in it. There are a bunch of requirements in here. So we'll see some of the libraries that we're going to install. Now, this code I'm going to run on Hopsworks itself. If you run this outside of Hopsworks, you'll also have to install the Hopsworks library. So you'll pip install Hopsworks and, and you're good to go. Now, if you're familiar with, with some of these libraries, you realize that we're going to use GPUs in here because when we use an LLM, uh, we'll need to have GPUs. So you can probably try and run this in Colab. And um, I haven't tried to run this in Colab for uh, just for full disclosure, but it, 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 you know, you, if you get a, a, a T4 GPU, it's 16 gigabytes, it may, may work in your case. So we're going to use the transformers. Uh, we're going to download a bunch of models from Hugging Face with transformers, uh, another bunch. We're going to use um, uh, quantized models as well, so bits and bytes. Um, and so on. So th there there are dependencies. Let's get in and look at what we're going to actually do. So I'm going to walk you through what we want to see in the system first, and then uh, then we'll go through building the actual system. So I have this uh, project in Hopsworks. So Hopsworks as a platform is organized by projects. You can see I have lots of projects here. This is one in which we ran this demo already. I'm going to go down to a clean project, and we're going to run it all from scratch so you'll get an idea of what we need to do. So um, what we get out of the project, uh, this, this one in the middle, I just created it, we'll, leave, we'll ignore that. We have these checks that came in. The checks, we can see there's a number of features, a check number, there's a user one, two, the amount of money in the check in text, the amount written in numbers, um, the file and so on. We can, we can get a quick preview of that data, but this is the data that we're going to train a, a, a prediction model for a fraud. So you can see we have the amount of uh, uh, the check that's being spent, the amount of money in numbers, the amount that's written in text. In this case, you can see, for example, that that this number 128 does not correspond with the num amount of numbers. So we actually have a, fe a feature here saying whether they, they, they match yes or no. So in that case, it's false. But if we take the second one here, we've got 1,787, which corresponds to the amount of numbers. So that's an extra feature that we're going to create. Uh, we've other uh, features related to the name of the bank, um, whether the spelling is correct or not, username, and so on. And then we have the label down here, whether the check is valid or not. So this data set is available in the repo. Uh, you can get at it there. We're going to create some features from the raw data first in order to create this feature group. So this feature group is the, the raw is the features we're going to use to train our model with. 
Um, the model will train in Hopsworks. The way it works is that you create a feature view. You select features from many different feature groups to create a, a feature view. Um, so you can see here, we're not, we don't have a huge number of features that we need for this model. Like, is the spelling correct? Does the amount of uh, the check in, in letters and numbers match? And then we have a label that's valid. You could use other features, but they're not particularly predictive for this data set. So it's a very simple um, model that's going to use that we're going to use here. And then we'll train a model and we'll store the model in Hopsworks. This is the check fraud detection model. We got some model metrics for it, some feature importance scores for it. Um, and you know you can have a look at the actual model in here itself and you can see that it's uh, um, uh, we're saving it as a JSON. So I think it's an XGBoost model exported as a JSON here. And then finally, what we'll have in our inference pipeline is we're gonna output to, uh, to a table um, the predictions of all the new checks as to whether they're fraudulent or not, and the description of whether we think they're why we think they're fraudulent if they are so. So this is the table we're going to output them to. This is a, a feature group in Hopsworks. It actually is also a MySQL table, so you could plug in your dashboard uh, uh, to this MySQL uh, table and access the data from there. So that's typically how you know a decision support system would use the output of this AI system. They connect to this table read the output and then um, when they have to issue the reports and why the, why the checks are considered fraudulent, they can just copy and paste the text from here. So we can see, for example, here, it says um, for check ID six, the check is considered fraudulent because the amount of words is, is missing, which the crucial details should be included in a valid check. Okay, it sounds reasonable. So that's what we're going to do. Um, and I'm going to do it in the clean project. So I just created a clean project here. And here we can see it's a project, JDCH. There's nothing in here. You can run this code from outside of Hopsworks if you want to run it on your laptop and just clone it on your laptop and run it. The reason I'm running it in Hopsworks is because I have some GPUs in here. Um, I've already actually started up a notebook. Um, there is four GPUs on the server, but other people are using it, so there's none free. So I've got to, I hope, hopefully no one takes my, hopefully I don't stop this notebook and someone takes my free GPU. Hopsworks is multi-tenant. You can have many users on a, on a cluster and they all share the GPUs there. So the first thing I do when I create a project in Hopsworks here is I need to get my code and we want to get the Hopsworks uh, tutorial. So in this case, in, uh, inside Hopsworks, you can clone the repo. So you can go in here, clone the repo, paste in the repo that, uh, that we had earlier. And I did this already, um, just to speed it up. So I put in the Hopsworks tutorial. I took the main branch. Um, you should probably go ahead and not clone the main branch because any changes you make, you won't be able to save. So what you should probably do here is uh, fork this tutorial, fork this uh, repo. So if you fork it here to your account, then clone the URL from your account. So when you're cl cloning it, I tend to use the SSH one, but in Hopsworks, um, we typically use the HTTPS one. And then the way in which you you uh, add your credentials in Hopsworks is that you go to your account settings and you set up a Git provider and you add your Git um, token in here. It says my GitHub username and then my token in here. So then, then I'm able to push changes back to my repo. Okay, the second thing I need to do after I've cloned this is there were a bunch of requirements that I needed to install. So what I did was I went to my Python environment here in Hopsworks. Let's just minimize myself here. And then I press install library. So uh, when I install, I, I have many options in, uh, for installing code. I can install with pip or conda or wheel files or even git URLs. In this case, I want to add a requirements.txt file, which came in the tutorial. So it's actually from the project. So I did this already. But basically, I cloned my, my repo into this Jupyter folder. And then in here, you'll be able to see it's in the advanced tutorials, it's in the fraud check detection. And then this was the file that I that I installed. So I ran this already. It takes a, you know, a couple of minutes. It's going to install a bunch of libraries. And um, we can check, for example, if Transformers is here. We can see it's installed Transformers 4.39.3 and bits and bytes and a few others. They're all in here. OK, so once that's set up, then you can start your notebook. and. Um, so I'm going to run these uh, these particular programs as notebooks. <clears throat> now, one thing that we do with notebooks is that we don't put all the code in notebooks, right? So notebooks are great for educational purposes. Um, you can run them as jobs. In Hopsworks, you can run them as jobs if you like. Many people do not like running them as jobs. In Hopsworks, if you run it as a job, um, what you can do is it'll run it actually as a... Um, uh, 
uh, I can't remember the name of the framework as a framework by Netflix anyway for running running Python notebooks as jobs. Um, it begins with P, I think. But anyway, in any case, we use, we use that framework to run the notebooks as job paper mill. Sorry, thank you. So paper mill um, we use to run these notebooks as jobs. But you may decide, well, I'm not going to use a notebook as a job, and that's fine. You can go ahead and write your code uh, as a Python program. But when, even when we write notebooks as as jobs, and we want to run them here. What we often do is we put common code in separate modules. So I have, for example, this code for check. This is a, a Python module that's used inside my notebook. And you can see here that we're going to import this check.py file um, into one of our notebooks or a couple of them and use this code. Now, if you're going to run this particular, um, if you're going to run the, this particular example in Colab, what you should note, which is very important, is that um, a couple of these cells won't work, right? So this cell here won't work. Be the reason why is because Colab is not good for building, writing modular Python programs. If, uh, your notebook wants to import a local. Here we've got, you can see I'm from functions, utils, import these particular uh, modules that's in here. So you've got this utils, it's asking me to import these, these functions. Um, in Colab, uh, these files won't be on the local instance. You'll just have this notebook feature pipeline one, and this will fail. So what you'll need to do if you want to do that is you just can run in the cell beforehand, w get, uh, well, first you want to make this directory. So make dir um, uh, functions. I have it already there. And then it'll create the directory. And then after that, you'll want to do something like w get to download. Uh, well, firstly, we need to change directory to the functions directory, and then we'd uh, let me see, and then we'll we'll do w get to download the files. So if you want to download those files, um, you can go in here. This is where we were earlier, and um, we had the features file. So I want to download this check file. I just go to this raw link here and then click that URL. So I, I get the raw link here, and then I go back to my notebook, type in this, and it'll download it. So then these files will be available locally in your in your um, Colab notebook, and you're ready to go. But most of the rest of us will not be using Colab. Um, you might be using, like me, Jupyter Notebooks. And if you're running in Hopsworks, it'll, you'll have this Jupyter Notebook out of the box. So we're going to start by importing uh, some of these uh, Python modules and functions that we've defined. And um, this is a Python notebook. Let me say before I started, I did need to say I had a GPU for this notebook. So let's have a look at the configuration that I set up to get that. So when I when I started the notebook, I configured it to say I need one GPU, six cores, and 54 um, gigabytes of memory. That's quite a lot of memory. I probably don't need that much, but I just took it anyway because I have it in the cluster. If you want to validate that you have the GPU, you can just, in the notebook, in our Jupyter notebook, we can drop to a terminal like this, and we can go to bash. Um, we have a very long uh, path here, so I'm just going to change my path to look like a bit smaller. One equals just make it a little bit kind of uh, you can zoom in as well. Okay, so um, I just changed to bash, and um, you can see here that when you come into Hopsworks, the the projects, the folders that are available in your project are are all available from the command line here. So I can go to my Jupyter notebook command line here. I can see stuff like this, and then I can check for I can run. I'm mean, basically inside the Docker container running that notebook, and I can see. Yeah, I've got a, a, an NVIDIA GPU. Um, it's an RTX A6000. And, you know, if I want to um, have a look like this. So um, pull up my load. So that, that's basically all I need to do to figure out, okay, I've got a GPU on this machine. We're, we're good to go. So let's go back and start a notebook. We ran the first cell already. And uh, this data here, this th that we're going to train our model on and create our features with, it comes in the repo. Um, we can have a look at it briefly before we get started. But let's go into Hopsworks. So I checked out the code into my file browser into this Jupyter uh, directory here. So I got this Jupyter directory. So it's all in here. I've got advanced tutorials. It was the fraud check detection one. And then the data is in this data folder here. Okay. So uh, we've got this CSV file that we're going to use. We're going to read this. Um, you can see here we have 4,770 rows. And then it has um, the data that it extracted from the, from, the, from the check, from the image. So this was our OCR program has already run. And that OCR program 
um, is basically uh, extracted that text and stored it in this CSV file. So we can see what some of these checks look like. You can see there's no bounding box on it uh, currently. We just have the, the check itself and the bank name, and, and they're all pretty similar at some level. So the, those ones are Axis. You can you know, go down and see this one's by Credit Agricole and, uh, and so on. So French also use checks, by the way, which surprised me when I was doing research for this. Okay, um, let's go back to our notebook. And we're going to go through this. We're reading this um, CSV file up that contain, contains the, the output of our OCR system. And we can just see how much data is in here. Uh, we can see the we've got a thousand rows that we've actually read. So in this case, we, we limit it to just a thousand. And um, let's go look at the counts. We have uh, 8,000, or sorry, it's 10,000, not 1,000. Not um, we have 8,000 rows that are uh, valid and 2,000 that are um, invalid. Now, that's re relatively okay balance to train a, a very simple um, model on for supervised machine learning. You want to have some sort of balance. If you have a very imbalanced data set, you might need to use a library like imbalance to upsample the, the smaller uh, set or, or downsample the larger set. Okay, so let's just... Uh, have a look, we can load the images. There's some code for that. The, the load images code, if we look at it, is this function show image. Um, I think it's in this utils i. You can see in here, we're basically using matplotlib to, to, to visualize that image. And loading the image, we're using pill. Okay, so it's pretty straightforward stuff. Um, so yeah, so we can see here some examples of valid checks. Sorry, invalid, so valid equals zero. We're, we're basically saying, this is not a valid check. And we can see some of the reasons why this one, 502, is missing an amount in text. Uh, 504 is missing an amount in numbers. We can see for 500, the amount in text doesn't match the amount in numbers. And uh, same goes for 501, and same goes for 503. So it's a pretty simple model for predicting um, invalid checks. So not necessarily fraud, but just checks that aren't valid. Um, you know, people could have made mistakes on them for example. So um, another thing to do is check for spelling mistakes. So that's a reasonable feature that helps uh, predict whether a check is fraudulent or not. So maybe there's missing text or maybe the text is, is uh, spelt incorrectly. And, um, you know, what we're doing here is just having a little bit of EDA. If we move further down, we can see that like from the, oops, the uh, letter, what did I miss, miss run, running a cell there? Uh, okay, so now we've got that. I missed run, running a cell. So we can see here now that we've got uh, 6,410 valid uh, samples and 3,590, uh, which are considered fraudulent text, which is a pretty good balance in the data set. So what we're going to do, it's in our data frame here, and, and we're going to upload that data frame to Hopsworks. So we're going to write that data frame to a feature group that we create called Check Feature Group. It does have a primary key, the check number. That means that uniquely identifies each check. So we can insert that. And um, we've also got a version associated. So if you were over time to add new features from your checks, you maybe uh, decide, oh, I'll add this new feature or I'll change an existing feature. You might decide then to have version two of this particular feature group. So we, we now have um, uploaded our data frame into our feature group called check underscore FG. It's version number one and has a primary key. So we can just jump back to Hopsworks to see um, where that is. So we can see here that this is it. This is our check FG. And um, the data is coming in here. In fact, it should have kicked off an ingestion job, which we can see it's running here. So the way that data gets uploaded at the moment, um, from a Python client, we then run a, a background ingestion job. But in Spark, it can write directly to the feature group if it's online only. For, online, for offline only, sorry. For, for online and offline, where you're going to access the data um, uh, with low latency from a, the, the low latency API to the feature groups, uh, then we always go through, uh, we run the ingestion jobs uh, in the background. So let's have a look at the data. We, we've we written this in here. There's 12 features. Um, the actual storage format we're using here in this case is Apache Hoodie. We also support Delta Lake as a storage format. And um, we can see the metadata for it. We can also move down and have a look at the activity, you can see what's happening. We can see that it ingested 10,000 rows and um, it'll compute some statistics over it. So we can see here that, um, you know, if we look at um, the, 
uh, some of these different features, we depending on the type of feature, um, here we've got the amount of numbers, um, we, it's just computed completeness, whether there's missing values or not. Uh, the number of distinct values is 5,703 from 10,000. Um, and then we have 10 different banks in here. So it's a, it gives you a basic way of doing EDA on our data without running it all through a complex Jupyter notebook. Um, in this particular case, we have a numerical feature and we can, uh, it's an int and it'll compute descriptive statistics for you. But if for categorical features, we're just getting um, distinct counts and completeness. We can preview the data as well. You can see, okay, what does the data look like that's written in here? And this is uh, an example for it and, and um, the data is in there. There is also a, an ability to do feature monitoring. I'm not gonna go through that today. Uh, but feature monitoring is when we um, deploy a model or when we have a pipeline set up for a model. In this case, it's a batch um, AI system. So what we would do is we would basically say, okay, new checks will arrive every day and our training data set will be the reference window. And then our detection window for identifying um, drift uh, could be the new batch of checks that come in every day. We'll call that the detection window. You could change the detection window to be the last week or the last month, or you could have multiple monitoring cases where you're checking the last day, the last week, last month. Um, so that's our feature pipeline uh, completed. And um, now we're going to move on to train a model, a very simple model. So training pipeline here. And the model we're going to train here is an XGBoost classifier. And we are going to evaluate it with some libraries from, from sklearn. So we'll compute things like the F1 score from it. And the way it works in Hopsworks is that uh, we have this table of features um, called the check feature group. And we're going to use that as the basis for, for training a model. Now, typically, you would have features in many different feature groups. And you would select features from different tables, join them together. In this case, we only have the one feature group but we're still gonna use this feature view as a way of reading the data. So the basic uh, principle in Hopsworks is you write to these tables called feature groups and you read via these feature views. And the feature view is just metadata. It's basically a selection of features from different feature groups. So in this case, what I do is I basically say create a feature group and, I, and it's item potent. So we get our create, so I can rerun the cell many times. And what it does is it basically says the the query or the list of features will be select these three features, spelling is correct, amount letter number match and valid as, as the columns I'd like to include from that particular feature group, check feature group. So I've selected those columns. I've identified the label as being the valid column. That's this one we have here. And then I don't, I'm not gonna use the other columns. They're not predictive for this particular problem. Again, these are versioned and have a description. And after we've created it, we can go back to our um, UI and we can see that the feature view will have appeared in here. And this feature view is um, the abstraction we're going to use for both training and inference. It will ensure we have no skew between training and inference. We'll use this feature view to create training data. We'll also use it to get batches of inference data in our inference pipeline. And that will ensure that when we train and we do inference, that the order of these features will be always the same, the type of them will be always the same, um, and we won't have any encounter any skew. So let's look at how we get training data from our feature view. Let's move this over here. So we're going to call uh, feature view dot train test split. Train test split is 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 very similar to the uh, scikit learn uh, library call that many of you will know that takes a, a data frame and and splits it into training sets and test sets of features and labels. So we've got X train, which is our features in the train set, X test features in the test set, labels in the training set, Y train, and Y test are the labels in the test set. So it's gonna to go to the uh, to the feature store, read that data back. Um, and you can see we've got our data back here. We can have a quick look at the data there. We can see how many rows there are. There's you know 10,000 or 8,000 rows that we talked about earlier. Um, and now we've got our data in, in a very nice, easy format to train a model with. All we need to do is instantiate an XGBoost classifier. We're not going to use any hyperparameters here. Um, and then we're going to fit our data on it. And you can see it runs really fast because we have a small amount of data here. So we've now trained a model called XGB underscore classifier. And we're going to evaluate the performance of that model. So we'll evaluate it on the test set. So we'll make some predictions on our model with the features in the test set, and then we'll compare the predictions from the test set 
with the with the predictions made by the model. And then we'll compute our accuracy based on that. So we can see it's 96% accurate, um, has an F1 score of 0.95. Okay, and the confusion matrix looks like this. So we have some, some false negatives here. Um, so with this model that we trained, which is this XGB underscore classifier model, um, what we can do is we can then store it in the model registry in Hopsworks. And um, to do that, before we store it, we're going to actually put in some images in there as well. So we have this feature importance um, image that we've saved and we created here. We can see we created it from um, the feature importance was, uh, let me see, uh, from the PLT object here, which is computed in plot importance. Yeah, sorry. So we're using plot importance uh, to basically uh, uh, calculate the feature importance from our model. And then with this plot importance uh, object, um, it, it it basically sets up PLT, and then we're going to save the figure in there. Okay. So in order to save this figure, we need to put it in a local directory. So what we do is we create a local directory called check underscore fraud detection model. You can give it any name. The name doesn't really matter. We create that directory. And then we create a subdirectory of that directory called images. And any images we put in there will be upload it to the model registry along with the model. We'll need to put the model in this directory as well in order for it to be uploaded. So the way we do that is you can see here, um, yeah, model.json. So where do we save model.json? Uh, so look, save big, we have save model. Okay, it's down here. This is where we're saving our model. Uh, but we'll look at the way it works is basically firstly, we connect to the model registry in Hopsworks. And then we give the schema to the model. So the schema will come from our training and um, our training set. We can take the features as for the input and the output are the, the labels. Um, and we basically say, this is our model schema. And then we save our model. So it's an XGBoost model. So we can call save model. It will save it as a .json object in this model directory. And um, the, the uh, performance of our model that we we computed earlier, we're going to put it into a dict. We have some different categories we want to save here. So accuracy, precision, uh, recall, and F1 score. So this res dict, we're going to save along with our model. So we give the model a name. Um, let me run some of these because I forgot to run all of these. Uh, so let's see, we, we run this one, I believe. Uh, we'll run all of these cells. And um, now we're creating the model. Um, and we're also seeing the last line here, it then we, we've created this model, it's a Python model, and uh, we've given it the schema, our uh, performance uh, 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 properties in a dict. Um, you can also put in an example row so that if you want to create a deployment in it, you can just press test to test that deployment. And then finally, we have a description of it. And what we do is we then with this with this object, which represents our model in the model registry, we upload our model. If you run this code in Hopsworks, it'll just copy the data from the file system here locally to the Hopsworks file system. Um, but if you run it remotely, it'll upload that data via REST call. Uh, the reason why I mentioned that and it's important is if you're training or fine-tuning very large language models, uploading them via REST API generally doesn't work. Um, the models are extremely large. You have very long timeouts. So often it makes sense for model registries to be able to have this direct file system uh, access support because you know, you're know you training maybe 20 gigs or 50 gigs or hundreds of gigs potentially, you're gonna save. Um, uploading that by REST API becomes problematic. Okay, so we've run this. Let's have a look at what happened. Um, so we used our feature view here and it should have output a model here. And you can see now we have our, our check fraud detection model and um, it uploaded our model metrics. Uh, we uploaded the feature importance graph. And then if we look for the actual model in here, we can see that these are the files that represent our models. So the models are actually stored in the file system in a directory called models check fraud detection and then the version of the model. And you can see here, this is our actual serialized model. And then the images that we had here that, that are shown in the UI are stored in that subdirectory. You can also have a readme in here, so you can create a readme and edit it. Um, so that can be a model card for your model, which is often required by many organizations for explaining the, the, the purpose of the model and also its performance characteristics and the scope under which the model can be used. So we've now gone through two thirds of the way. We've done our feature pipeline, our training pipeline, our, and now we're gonna move on to our inference pipeline. 
So the inference pipeline here is a batch inference program. So it's going to take a, a load of checks, a bunch of checks, and it's going to um, predict whether they are fraud or not, and then generate a description for them. So, um, so let's have a look at what we're going to do here. We're going to first import some of these functions that we're going to use. Um, so you can see some of them are just loading images, uh, parsing checks and the text for them, evaluating whether they're fraud or not. And then we have, in this case, we have our LLM chain. So the LLM chain is going to use our LLM to generate the descriptions. Now I'm going to start this running because I ran this earlier and it downloaded my LLM. I think it was um, on the order of 20 gigabytes or something. So let's just see if it's if it's going to save it um, or if I have to download it again from scratch. Um, okay, it's downloaded already. So we're good to go, I think. Let's make sure. Yeah, we're good to go. Okay, so um, let's have a look here. Is this one? Okay, yeah, so we've downloaded it. Okay, so let's see this one, LM chain. Okay, let's, we'll move through it. So I've, that's good news. Um, otherwise, it might take quite a while. If it's, it's going to go to hugging face. So let me run through these cells and then we'll just, talk, I'll talk you through them. So first we would connect to Hopsworks, then we're gonna download our model. So we're gonna download the model from the model registry. It downloads it basically to a local directory. And then we need to, with XGBoost, uh, load up the uh, the, the uh, serialized uh, JSON file, which represents our model. The next thing we need to do is, is use our, if we look at this load check parser, this is gonna load um, our data. So let's have a look at that. So the load check parser is in the donut file, I believe, yeah. So let's go in here. So we have this, and this says load a check parsing processor and model from a specified directory and move the model to appropriate device. So in this case, we're downloading, you can see this donut processor. Um, and we're also loading the visual encoder, vision encoder decoder model from the pre-trained device. And, and we're gonna run this on a GPU ideally, um, because otherwise it can be very slow. Okay, so we have that, that runs. And the next thing we're gonna do is load our image. Um, we're going to uh, extract the text from it and then print it out on the screen. So we can see here's our image. We've extracted the text from it and everything looks good. And we've got a bunch of images here and you could replace these numbers with some other image numbers you see in the data directory. And then we can use our model to check if, if uh, evaluate whether a particular um, potential model is considered fraud or not. And we can see here, it says, this is suspected as being fraud. Parse text one and parse text one, um, which is our first one up here, was this one here. It's basically saying, oh, these features where we can see you've got 3,785, it doesn't match the amount uh, 3,755. So it's not surprising that the model predicted that this was fraud. And we can do this for the other images that we, we um, we we just checked so we have the second one it's saying it's valid the third one um it's saying it's it's valid and then the next one is the model is saying it's fraud okay so that's that's all good to go now we're going to try and get an explanation for our, our model and this is the one that takes quite a while in the download so I, I i actually left this notebook open I, I had run it earlier but i hope it'll load all the checkpoints from disk which it did this is the part which can take um depending on your internet, if you've got 16 gigabytes to download, it can take quite a while. Works very well in Colab um, for that matter. So let's look at the code for this, uh, get LLM chain. So we can see what we're actually downloading here. So get LLM chain starts here. We can see that it initializes and returns a language model chain for text generation using Hugging Face Transformers library. So we have as a parameter, the name of the model. Now we're using Llama 3 which is a very recent model, the 8 billion uh, parameter model. So that's a it's a it's a very high quality one. I think for that particular scale, it's probably the best quality model out there today. Um, if you're using things like fun function calling that I talked about in the in the first Makerspace series, it, it works really well for function calling as well. So um, that's the one we want to use. So we call this fa a function load LM model ID, and that's this function here. Um, you do have to have your Hugging Face API key set. So if it's not set in your environment variable, you'll have to enter your Hugging Face API key. So I had it ready here in case I needed to copy it. I would just copy it from here, and then you can paste it into the notebook. It'll actually prompt you in the notebook to enter it. But the best way to do is to set it as an environment variable, so it won't prompt you. It'll just pick it up from here. 
So that's going to download the to get our tokenizer for the model and then download the model. And it's what takes quite a while. So after we have our, our tokenizer and our model, um, we you know have to do a little bit of work. And this is pretty boilerplate code that you'll find for LLMs. Um, you know, in this case, we have to say specifically for this tokenizer, what are the special tokens that indicate the end of a sequence? And it's this particular one for, for this uh, Llama 3 tokenizer. And then we have, you can see a bunch of parameters that we have related to the actual model itself that we can set up. So, you know, we've got our model and our tokenizer in this pipeline, but we can add things like the, the, the temperature as a hyperparameter, uh, how many tokens we want to generate, um, what are specifically are, are these terminator tokens or the end of sentence token ID. Um, depending on your model, you may need to change those. So with this text generation uh, pipeline, we can um, create a, a hugging face pipeline um, and pass that then to uh, Langchain. So Langchain will be our, uh, where we'll, we'll handle, handle the prompts over and back, okay? So you pass in a prompt and, and then we'll get back the answer. You can set this to be true, verbose, if, you, if you're debugging and want to figure out what's going on. So um, let's go with the first one. So the first one was uh, number two image. And um, let's see what happens. It's called generate response. We can see that it says, okay, uh, the numbers match the amount, the spelling is correct. Um, the amount of words, amount of numbers match. It looks good. Um, let's go for our next one. We'll see if we get uh, a mismatch. So you can see the first one returned a bit quicker because in this case, we didn't need to load the LLM or you can see it's still running here actually. Okay, so it's running in the background. So it's, a, it's actually taking a bit longer than I, than I expected. Uh, but let's go and have a look at the code, generate response. We'll go in here. So this is our function here. So what we pass in here for generate responses, we pass in the image that we, the check image that we want to extract. We want to uh, evaluate it for fraud. So this is our, um, and then generate a response using the, the, so we have our image path with the processor, which is the, the processor that's going to process the image data for us. Um, the model, let's use to parse the text from the image. And we can see if we go back here, um, we have this model parser and our fraud model for fraud detection. We defined them earlier here. So let's go all the way back up here. Um, and they came from the load check parser. So let's go and look at that again. The load check parser. So these were the, um, this is our, our donut processor that was a pre-trained model that we're using. And then this vision encoder decoder model that, that we're using for this particular example. Okay, and then we, we move on and we, we pass in the model for actual fraud detection. That's the one, the XGBoost model we trained then the Langchain object and whether we're going to be proposed or not, and then the path where the image is stored. So by default, that will be data images. So let's go back here and go down to our code here. Okay, so we've loaded up our models. Okay, so um, yeah, so actually these were the ones that I ran earlier and we saw they printed out the responses. So it said the check is considered valid um, the next one says the check is considered valid, and then this one's considered fraudulent due to a mismatch in between the alphanumeric and numeric values. Okay, so this is just trying out the model and seeing if, yeah, our LMS seems to work great. It, it generates the data. Now, if we want to do a, a batch inference, an actual program that will take the data that arrives daily. So you can see I, I ran this earlier and it gave me an error because it says there's no such directory as checks batch. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to create a directory Let's see where we are. Let's do control C. Um, okay, so we're in this Hopsworks tutorials, advanced. And then we're in the fraud check detection. So I'm going to create a directory here. We'll call it the uh, same name that I said earlier, checks batch. And so what our, our batch program uh, expects here is that every day a bunch of new checks images will end up in this checks batch directory. So let's um, copy an image in there. Um, let's have a look at what images we have here. Uh, they're in here. Uh, there's loads of images. Okay, so we'll copy 873. It's just the last one that I can see here. To um, just like this, check fraud, not check fraud detection model. It was the 
check batch, checks batch with an ES. Okay, so I'll copy that one there. And uh, we could probably copy another one if we wanted to. Let's just pick some other random one here. Uh, one, 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 two, four. Okay, so we've got a couple of images in there. So checks, let's have a look. Okay, so we've got those two images in there now. So our pipeline will run daily and we'll expect there's some job which is uploading our, our, our images of the checks that, that have been scanned into here. And then our, our batch inference program will run daily. So we run it here, we can see it says, okay, I found two, two checks in there. And then what we're doing is we're basically, uh, you can see here is we're, we're going to use our LLM to generate the uh, responses that we want. And we're going to get back ultimately a data frame, a pandas data frame, which will have the status of the check, whether it's considered fraudulent or not, valid or not, and then a description of why it's considered fraudulent or why it's considered valid generated by our LLM. So um, what we're going to do with, with this data frame, which is going to take those two images and generate that data for us, is we're going to create a feature group. We're going to store that data in a feature group. This is the output of our AI system is this batch program. And we're going to have three different features, the check ID, the status, and the description. We're going to create a feature group for it. And uh, we'll make it online enabled to Hopsworks means it's available by the MySQL um, uh, server. So that means you can plug this into you know, your uh, decision support tool uh, very easily. And then um, we just have a little check here to, uh, to, to get the check IDs. And um, finally, this is what we're inserting into our feature group, this check validation data frame with index. Because right up here, this data frame here didn't have the check ID. So this code here is basically extracting the check ID from the, uh, from, uh, from the existing data set. It's a little bit of a hack, if you want to call it that. Okay, so you can see it's not super fast at the moment. Um, it's taking a little bit of time to, to kick off here. But what we can do if we want to look and see what the output is, because uh, that's what we want to go to, I'm just going to show you the, the project where this completed earlier. So what we get as an output then is this check validation feature group. And you can see in here, we have the check IDs, status, and description. And then we can see our outputs here. So description, the status, and then you have the status here is fraud valid yes or no and what you can do to set up this running is this is your batch program and every day you'll get a bunch of new uh, check images that will be validated and be inserted into this feature group and this will be the historical record that you can use um for for you know your organization uh, for managing all of the predictions your ai system makes over time and the fact that this is backed by you know time travel you'll be able to go back in time to see when things are added and so on uh, which which helps uh, quite a lot. So um, let's see, is this one still going here? Yeah, so this one seems to have finished and um, it then, it created a check IDs and this, yeah, it should, we didn't run the last line. So let's run the last line to insert it into our, um, into our new feature group. So it's uploading the rows, it's only a couple of rows. Um, and that's basically it. So that's, if we go back to our, our project, this one here, we can see, yeah, it created our new, feature group and um, the ingestion job for it should have just kicked off. We have a look at it here. We can see that it's running um, and then we can, um, yeah, we can see basically that that's the end. That's the way it worked. One thing I didn't show you was provenance, which is just uh, when you've trained a model, you can see, for example, you know, we have this uh, original feature group and we have the feature view and the training data set used to create from it. So all that information is captured and available in here as well. We didn't look at, at data validation. So using great expectations, validate data, that's something you could add to it. Um, if you're using, if you care about governance and you want to have, um, you know, an ontology or some sort of knowledge graph for, for defining these features and, and being able to find them and describe the scope under which your features can be used. So when, when, what types of models can use this and what geographic area or what types of users you can define uh, schematized tags here. So tags corresponding to a schema that you define with your governance rules in it. So that's basically it. Um, you know, I think uh, it's, it's, a, it's an interesting new area, uh, LLMs. You can do many, many things. And, and one of the last things I thought when I heard fraud detect or 
uh, fraud detection for checks would be an, uh, an application area for LLMs, but, but it is because there's a very manual labor intensive stage of describing the reason why a, a check is considered fraudulent. And uh, that's what the LLM will help accelerate. So um, if there aren't any questions, um, I think we'll, we'll wrap it up there. Um, just to throw you back, this video will be available on the YouTube on the Hopsworks channel. And um, there are two other Makerspace series on, on indexing private PDFs uh, and querying them with LLMs, and also function calling uh, using an air quality prediction uh, system, so an air quality forecasting system. Um, so tune in for the next one um, and, you know, go to our Slack, check out Opsrx, register an account, and, and you can go ahead and reproduce this uh, tutorial if it's of interest to you or reach out to us if you have questions on Slack. Thanks a million for listening. Have a great uh, rest of your day.